This is a relationship conference, and it's a marital relationship conference, okay? Let's start from where it all began from, from the book of Genesis, chapter 2. If you are looking for a title for this message, it is titled, Marriage, the God's Way. Marriage, the God's Way. I'm going to share some things with you today that may be unconventional, and you're going to see it from the pages of scriptures as authentic. Marriage, the God's way. Let's look at where it all began. Genesis chapter 2, from verse 18 to 25. Genesis chapter 2, from verse 18 to 25. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam named gave names to all the cattle and to, all, to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from him, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And verse 23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Marriage, the God's way. Marriage, the God's way. Can I admit with you to you today that marriage is good? Marriage is a good thing. Marriage is a God thing. Marriage is good. Contrary to what public opinion may be, marriage is good. You know, the Bible says that in the last days, many will forbid to marry. That is why we are having the marriage rate dropping by the year. It's, it's nothing to do with marriage. It's just biblical prophecy coming to pass. Many are forbidden to, marriage, to marry. And one of the reasons why people are forbidden to marry, number one, is because of lack of knowledge of what marriage is. Number two is the experience of others or themselves in marriage or about marriage. Many people grew up from some not, uh, not so stable homes. Some grew up without their parents together. And that has shaped their idea of what marriage looks like. That has modeled to them what marriage looks like, and they've said to themselves, if this is marriage, I don't want to be a part of it. So marriage itself is good. Marriage is of God. The marriage, according to God, is between a man and a woman. It's between a man born as a man. You know, you have to specify these days, amen? <laughs> Uh, a man and a woman, born as a man and a woman born as a woman, all right? So it is very clear that God had the knowledge of these end times in mind when he specified that this is what marriage is. Marriage is between a man born as a man and a woman born as a woman. In that scripture we read in Genesis chapter, 20, chapter 2 and verse 22, the Bible says, And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman 
and brought her unto the man. God said, man shall not be alone. And he, he brought a woman. He made a woman and joined him to the man. And Jesus confirmed this also in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4. Jesus validated this instruction that marriage is between a man born as a man and a woman that was born as a woman. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19 verse 14, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that which he made them at the beginning, made them male and female? And verse 5 says, And, and, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twine shall be one flesh. God's primary intention for marriage is for improvement. God created Adam and God saw that Adam could do better, could achieve more. Adam could become better. And God said, if I leave him by himself, he's going to settle for where he is. He's going to settle in his accomplishment without knowing that there is more that he can achieve. This is why a good woman will always bring out more in the man she's married to. A good wife will always help her husband identify and tap into the potentials that he didn't even know he carried. God saw that man was just settling and God said, no, it is not good for you to be like this. I want to see you do better things. I want to see you achieve greater things. I want to see you become the better version of yourself. So God created an institution called marriage for improvement, for upgrade, for betterment. Am I going too fast for those who are writing? Let me repeat that. God's primary intention for marriage is for improvement, for upgrade, for betterment, for increase, and for good things. God's primary intention for marriage is for improvement, for upgrade, for betterment, for increase, and for good things. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. The Bible says that two is better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Two is better than one. I don't know, and it doesn't matter how well you are doing as a single, if you marry right, you will achieve more. Yes, if you marry right, you will become better because that is why God instituted that marriage, that, that institution. God instituted it because two is always better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. What else? God designed marriage to work, but unfortunately... Many marriages do not work. God designed marriage to work for your improvement. If you are in a marriage and things are not going well, something is wrong somewhere. If you are in a relationship and things start going down, you start losing your affection for God, you start losing the passion for the things of God, you start losing things that matter to you, you start losing people that matter in your circle, careful, something is not right. Because God designed marriage to work to make us better. Also, it is how you see marriage that will determine whether it works for you or not. It is how you see marriage that will determine if it will work for you or not. 
This is why you must learn marriage from God. Learn marriage from scriptures. Learn marriage from the word of God. Study marriages in the Bible. Look at God's intention for marriage and how to make marriage work. Marriage is good. Let me give you 10 benefits of marriage. And uh, after this, I'm a licensed minister. I can get you married right away. If you like any of these 10 benefits, if you're not already married. But let me share with you 10 things you stand to benefit if you marry right, if you marry well. Number one benefit is spiritual strength. Spiritual strength. Your spiritual strength ought to be amplified if you marry right. Your spiritual strength, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 30. I will try my best to go not too fast and not too slow because the heart of this conference is the question and answers. All right? So you may already know all these things I'm talking about, but I want to hear what you don't know so that I can help you by the Holy Spirit answer those questions. All right? Spiritual strength, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 30. The Bible says, how should one chase a thousand and put 10,000 to flight except their rock has sold them and the Lord has shut them up? Spiritual strength is amplified if you marry right. When you marry right, your spiritual strength is 10,000 what it was as a single. That's why you are able to chase one as a single. You are able to chase a 1,000. But when there's two of you, it is 10 times better than being single. Spiritual strength is a benefit of marriage. Number two, your prayer power is multiplied as a couple. Your prayer power is multiplied. A couple that is really united will receive speedy answers to their prayers when they pray to God about anything. This is a threat to the devil. This is a threat to the kingdom of darkness. When a truly united couple kneel down to pray, my God, the devil is afraid of those kinds of prayers. A couple is, that is more united. So for example, I know of a family, they had three girls and they wanted a boy. And They've tried everything, medically, and nothing worked. And one day, the woman told the husband, let us kneel down. She asked the husband, do you really want a boy? The guy said, yes. The, she also said, I also want a boy. I really want a boy. And she told the husband, let us kneel down and pray and ask God for a boy. And the man was like, wait, what are you talking about? We've tried everything. It hasn't worked. And she said, no. She had the revelation that in marriage, your prayer power is amplified. And she told them, let's do it. Long story cut short. They prayed. And they had the boy. And they had the boy exactly nine months from that day. When a couple is truly united, there is amplified prayer power. You know, as a single, let me put it this way. As a single, maybe you are praying for something for six hours before, it, before God answers. In marriage, you spend less time and cover more grounds because two is really better than one. I'll show you from scriptures. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. The problem is if the couple don't really agree, that's when there is delay in their prayers. That's what always happens. 
Matthew chapter 2, 18 verse 19. The Bible says, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. I know that you may say, what if I pray with my friend? But do you know that concerning the matters of your family, the best two people to pray and receive answers is you and your spouse? This scripture, in the context of marriage, applies only to the husband and the wife. So if something happens, let's say God forbid, to a child or a spouse, the prayers of the relatives will work, can work by faith, but the prayers of the spouse themselves together will work a lot more. That's one of the benefits in marriage. You can pray with your friends about what is happening in your marriage, but until you pray with your spouse about what is happening in your marriage, the answers may not come. Prayer power is a benefit of marriage. In fact, God told, Apostle Paul told men that they should always learn to be in one accord with their spouse so that their prayers will not be hindered. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. So you can pray with anybody else about what is going on in your home, but have you knelt down to pray with your spouse about that issue? That's what we are talking about. That's a benefit of marriage. Read that. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, talking about your wife, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being held together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Prayer power. Prayer power is a, one of the benefits of marriage. Number three. Divine favor is one of the benefits of marriage. Divine favor. Divine favor. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 22. Divine favor. Favor before God. Favor before men. For whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And obtaineth favor of the Lord. There are some favors God has reserved for the institution of marriage. That is why Jesus never went to any birthday party, but he went to a wedding. Because of the favor that he has left assigned for the marriage institution. This is very important. In marriage, there is strange favor. I mean, I can explain it with my own life. Because when you marry right, there are some things that you ask for from God, and there are some things that you don't even ask for that God does for you. Favor is one of the Fringe benefits of marriage. Number four, companionship. Companionship is the, one of the benefits of marriage. I don't know how close your best friend may be, but your best friend should be your partner, your husband, your wife. There are some things that you may feel very vulnerable to share with other people. That is why God created the marriage context so that you can share it with that your spouse and they can bear the burden with you. Companionship. Companionship. It is not good for a man to be alone. I will create a help meet for him. There are some decisions that you will make that you need a sound counsel, somebody that truly gets you. And the best person in that context should be your spouse. If your best friend that is not your spouse knows more about you than your spouse, you are doing it wrong. 
If you have a best friend from college, from work, from church, yeah, from church, that knows more about you than your spouse, you are doing it wrong. Your spouse should know almost everything. In fact, I'm saying almost everything because there are some things you two don't know about yourself yet. But your spouse will know. So God has designed marriage to provide the benefit of companionship. Decisions become holistic and void of errors. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 17. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 17. God designed marriage to give us the benefit of companionship. Proverbs 27 verse 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. That companionship you need, that bond that you need is best found in the marriage context. Marriage provides you with that benefit. Number five is divine security. Divine security is one of the benefits of marriage. This is something that helps you in your walk with God. Divine security. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. Benefits of marriage. Divine security. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. The Bible says, And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Let me explain that scripture. The Bible is saying that if an enemy attacks a person, the person could prevail against the enemy. But when it is two people, instead of just being defensive, two can attack, can withstand, can push back. All right? So you are not living your life defensively. In the context of marriage, you can now offensively defend your home. And then a threefold cord, that is God, the husband, and the wife, the Bible says, cannot be easily broken. Divine security. Divine security. I'm leaving out a lot of things because I, I, I want you to ask questions. <laughs> I want you to ask questions. Let's move on. Number six. Physical fulfillment is one of the benefits of marriage. God has put this sexual feeling in all of us. And the only approved way of its expression is in the context of marriage. It's physical fulfillment is one of the benefits of marriage. No matter how spiritual you are, no matter how uh, busy you are with life, your biology one day will communicate with you. And it starts as a child grows up from the age of puberty. He starts to feel some certain attraction towards the opposite gender. It's not a bad feeling. God put it there. God put it there. And that is God prompting us, pushing us, go and get married, go and get married, go and get married. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, from verse 1 to 4, Paul the apostle gave us a sound counsel. He said, now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, 
And likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife had not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband had no power of his own body, but the wife. And in verse 9, he says, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. If you cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. 1 Corinthians 7, 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Verse 9, not 5. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 9. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. All right? So if your child comes to you, they are of age, and they can't contain. Don't look at the finances. Let them marry. All right? Don't, don't, um, don't stop them. Let me put it this way. It's better they do it right with God than they doing it wrong and displeasing God. We must be very, very sensitive because when they do it wrong, so many things can go wrong. Even mentally, trauma in the life of the child. So when they're of age and they are mature, I'll talk about how certain things here in a few minutes. Instead of allowing them to burn, that is why a lot of people are into pornography, all these nasty things. Because they are burning and instead of marrying, they don't want to. Physical fulfillment to avoid temptations is one of the benefits of marriage. Number seven, benefit of marriage is procreation. Procreation, according to scriptures. Procreation. Telling you how we can do it right. I know some people want children without marriage, but that's not God's way. Some people have determined to be single parents by choice, and they just want to get a child, get pregnant, have a child or two, and they live like that way. That, again, is not God's agenda. God designed marriage for procreation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Genesis chapter 1. Well, let, let's keep 26 and 27. Let's just do verse 28. Genesis 1, verse 28. And God said, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Procreation, having children. Is one of the benefits of marriage. Number eight, divine presence. God loves homes. He loves marriages. He loves families. And he desires to be there. Divine presence. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 11. Benefit of marriage. The Bible says, again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? This is talking about divine presence in the context of a home. Remember, we just read that a threefold cord cannot be easily broken. The threefold cord is God, the man, and his wife. Divine presence. It's a benefit of marriage. God loves homes. God loves family. When Jesus is in your family, you will have a happy home. Number nine, benefit of marriage is honor. Honor. Marriage begat a certain level of honor. Honor. Do you know that even in America here, there are some jobs that they won't give to you, but they won't tell you why, but it's mostly because you are still single or you are not married. 
there are some jobs. Because as a, as a single person, one day you can just decide to move out of town. Right? You just pack up your bags, you're gone. You leave the job, you leave your responsibilities, you're out. But moving out of town is not as easy when you're married. <laughs> you can't just decide and pack your bags and go. You have to think about your, your wife, your husband, your job, you know, your children, their school, you know. It's not as easy. So they have more honor and regard for those who are married. And the Bible says that. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Honor. It says marriage is honorable. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. It says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But warmongers and adulterers, God will judge. Marriage is honorable. The condition for keeping that honor is keeping the bed undefiled. The condition for maintaining that honor and receiving that honor from God is to keep the bed undefiled. So wait till you are married. Before you express your sexuality or your sexual urges. Don't defile the bed. No sex before marriage. And I was telling my folks in my house a few, yesterday, I think last night, I was telling them, the Bible says, that don't awaken love until it is ready. Don't awaken love until it is ready. Don't set yourself on fire sexually until you are married. Watch those movies. Stay away from them. Be careful of them. Don't stir up love until it's ready. Don't stir up. When I was single, <laughs> there was a brother that was a part of, I had a prayer group, and there was a, a, a senior brother that um, we used to, we usually pray in his house. So we all gather, I think we're about 11 single men, we just pray, 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 pray. One day as we were praying, your pastor refused to close his eyes and was looking around this guy's house. And I saw his bookshelf. So I walked to his bookshelf and I saw a book in his bookshelf. It was titled, The Art of Kissing. I said, wow, okay. I said, this is a good topic to ask this guy what's going on. So after the service, I said, sir, I saw a book in your shelf. The title is The Art of Kissing. What are you learning about kissing if you're not supposed to kiss before marriage? And of course, he confessed to me that he has never even read the book. He just bought it. My point here is, if you read books like that, your, your, your senses will come alive. You'll be looking for the next person to kiss. It just happens that way. So don't awaken those things. You shouldn't be buying those kind of books until you are married and you have the room for its expression. Be very careful. The honor that is designed for married people can only be secured if the bed is undefiled. Not my words, but the words of God. You know, again, I'm, I'm trying to stay away from certain things because I want you to ask those questions. Some people have erroneous beliefs about marriage. Some people ask questions like, oh, how will I know that my partner can sexually satisfy me if we don't have sex before marriage? You have been watching too many movies. <laughs> you have been watching too many movies. Because I would also ask you, how did Adam know that Eve would satisfy her before he buried her? You see, all these things that you have put in your mind is what is causing that misconceptions. Don't worry about it. If you marry right, everything about those areas, God will take care of them. Just make sure you play your role. Keep the bed on the fire. Again, I'm not speaking about what the world says about marriage. I'm speaking about what God says about marriage. Number 10. Benefit of marriage is speedy restoration and recovery. 
speedy restoration and recovery. God has put marriage together to help us recover quickly from losses, from hurt, from disappointments, from everything the enemy has brought to us. That's why when you marry right, things ought to get better, better, better for you. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 10. Speedy restoration and recovery. Look at that. The Bible says, if they fall, one will quickly lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he had not another to help him up. When you are down, you are out, you are vulnerable, you are weak, your spouse should be able to quickly help you recover, especially in the context of marriage. Let, let me be very frank and sincere with you. Your best friends can't do this because everybody has their own issues. It is only your, ma your spouse that cares enough and you can have speedy restoration, speedy recovery in the context of marriage. Now, I'm going to share this, and then we're going to stop. We'll take some questions. If there are not enough questions, then I will continue the third leg of what I want to share. So I just shared the first part, the benefits of marriage. Now, in choosing who to marry, please prayerfully consider the following factors. Now, people think that the first condition of marriage is love. No, it is not. It is not love that is the first criteria or first prerequisite. In fact, love is number five, and I'll share those five things with you today. Love is actually number five. You see, what people, some people call love is just attraction. It's just, it's just mere attraction. You see a young lady, you see a young man, and you're attracted to them, you say you love them. And some people say there is love on first sight. That is not true. There is no such a thing as love on first, at first sight. There is attraction at first sight. There's infatuation, which is even worse than attraction. Infatuation is you see somebody that you're attracted to and you already want to go to bed with them. You're already imagining things in your mind. That's infatuation. But love is not at first sight. And it's not the first thing. What is the first thing in choosing who to marry? The first thing is divine direction. Divine direction. Let God lead you to your spouse. Let God direct you. Let God choose your spouse for you. Let God lead you to where your spouse will locate you. Divine direction. A family that God brings together have a higher chance of staying together. Divine direction. This is why it's important to be a child of God. This is why it's important to be born again. There must be a divine direction. Not every girl is your wife. Not every man is your wife. Let God lead you. Oh, you get to a church and there's six, six single ladies. And you start with dating one of them. Oh, it didn't work. Then you jump to number two and you jump to number three. That's not how to get married. That's not how to choose or how to find. You must be divinely led. When I was to get married, I was attracted to two ladies. And I went to one of my prayer partners. I said to him, I said, sir, I feel a pull towards these two ladies. The, his response made me go back and pray again. What did he say? He just asked me. He said, why are they two? That was the only thing he said. He said, why are they two? Why? God cannot lead you to two people. Why are they two? 
boy. That was the end of the conversation. I went back and I started praying again. And then God led me to one. And that's one I called my wife today. Praise God. God cannot lead you to two people. You are leading yourself. It's not either Peter or John. It's not either first Peter or second Peter. No. <laughs> it can be. It can only be one person. So make sure that it is God leading you, not your feelings leading you. This is very foundational. This is the first thing you must secure. If you need to pray, if you need to fast, if you need to get counsel, do whatever you can to confirm that it is God leading you to that person. And can I say this? If God leads you, there will be a confirmation from the other person. So it's not a one-way street of God leading you. God must also lead the other person to you. That is exactly what happened in the case of Adam and Eve. God brought all the women. You know there were multiple women in, in the Bible? The Bible didn't call them women. The Bible called them animals. God brought animals to Adam. said, name them. Which of these do you want to be your wife? The giraffe came with her long neck. Adam said, no, you're a giraffe. Go. <laughs> All the animals came, paraded their beauty before Adam. Adam said, no. And God said, okay, I will lead you to the one that is yours. And as soon as God made the woman and brought the woman to Adam, there was confirmation between both of them. Adam said, this is the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh, and she shall be a woman. And Eve also had that confirmation in her spirit that truly this is the man that I belong to. Secure divine direction in your quest to get married to anyone. So you must be a child of God. The Bible says... To be led, before you can be led by God, you must be a child of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 14. You must be a child of God before God can lead you. God must first be your shepherd before he can lead you. Romans 8 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You must be born again. You must be a child of God before God can lead you to his daughter or to his son in marriage. You must be born again. The Lord must be your shepherd. Psalm 23, verse 1 and verse 2. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The next verse, he leadeth me. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. You want divine direction. You don't want to date 14 women and they're all laughing at you. You know, some men don't have shame. My wife told me about a guy that came to their church when they were all single. And the guy tried to date all of them. So the girl started talking to them and said, look, watch out for this guy. <laughs> they started telling about, look, this guy has an agenda. He's just guessing. Guessing. How can you, only you in one church, you are dating, you've dated six sisters. Six. Stop this. I don't blame the guy as much. I blame the six sisters. I mean, you saw this guy try the first girl. He didn't work. And then you allow him bounce on you. Number two. Number three, two was watching, waiting. And then after he didn't work with number two, he bounced on you. Number three. What is wrong with you? But the brother must be led. God cannot lead you to two people. God cannot lead you to two people. And God cannot lead you wrong. Mm, God cannot lead you wrong. So secure divine direction, that's the basic. When people come to me and say, Pastor, there's this person I'm liking, or this person I'm, see, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, you know, I just want to know, um, you know, what do you think? The first thing I ask them is, have you asked God about it? Because that is basic, that is fundamental. Ask God about it. 
get clarity from God. That is the first. Not love, not what you call attraction. Don't see somebody and then you have already decided in your mind you are going to marry the person. No. Be guided by God. Also, don't let people force somebody on you to marry. Forced marriages don't work. Forced marriages are not God's kind of marriage. Don't let anybody force a brother or a sister. You know, there are some cultures in the African cycle or African circle that they say, oh, uh, this my child must marry this my friend's child. And they do everything possible to make sure that those children marry each other. That is not God's way of marriage. That is not God's kind of marriage. You must be led by God, not led by your parents, not led by your pastor. Amen? Because people put that responsibility and burdens on pastors. I've never told anybody who to marry. I've never. I just tell you, go and ask God. When you come back, me too, I will ask God and we will compare notes. And our notes will be the same if we talk to the same God. All right? So don't be forced by your pastor to marry somebody. Don't be forced by your parents. Don't be pressured by your friends. That's not God's kind of way. Don't be pressured by social status to marry somebody. Let God lead you. Let God lead you. Hear God by yourself and for yourself. When you get home, go and study the marriage of Isaac and Rebecca in Genesis chapter 24. Go and study it. You'll see why you must not allow anybody force you to marry. Genesis chapter 24. Let me just give you a summary. Abraham sent out his servant, go and get a wife for my son. The servant said certain prayers to God. God answered the prayer. When he went and told the parents of Rebecca or the kinsmen of Rebecca, they told him, we need to ask Rebecca herself. We're not going to force this girl on you. So if you look at Genesis 24 verse 59, they asked Rebecca, will you go with this man? And she said, yes, I will go. So when people force a man or a woman, a boy or a girl on you based on anything, it's not God's way. It's not God's way. Genesis 24, 59. Aha, 58, sorry. And they called Rebecca and said unto her, will you go with this man? He has said everything I said. He has convinced us. We are convinced. But we need to ask you. All right? Will you go with this man? So, number one thing to secure is divine direction. Number two, in choosing who you want to marry, please make sure you are compatible. Compatibility is super important. It's more than affections. You can be attracted to someone that you are not compatible with. Yes. They say beauty lies in the face of its beholder. You must make sure you are compatible. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. Many divorces are on the platform of incompatibility. They have rushed into the marriage before they realize, uh oh. Uh oh, we're not compatible. In fact, there's a term they call it. They call it unreconcilable differences. <laughs> that's the that's the team. The the, the 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 name they call it unreconcilable differences. That just means they are not compatible. They should have found that out since before even getting into it. Amos chapter three verse three says, "Can two walk together except they are compatible?" Marriage will only work when the two are compatible. Can I ask you, when last did you run a personality test on yourself? On yourself. 
Do you even know yourself? You have been living in that body for decades now. Do you truly know yourself? Compatibility begins with knowing who you are. There is a website called 50 Personalities. And of course, there are multiple websites like that where you can go and they will ask you certain questions and they will describe you to you. You must first know you. And of course, in the process of getting to know an individual, make sure that they know you. The you that you, at least you know now. They must know. And you also must know them. And make sure that you are compatible. Compatibility is important. In fact, medical compatibility is also super important. If you have the AS genotype, they will tell you you are not compatible to marry another person with AS. Because the chances of having a child with a sickle cell, which will create unnecessary stress in that marriage, is there. So compatibility is super important to establish before you get married. You have heard from God. Now, am I compatible with this person? Are there adjustments I need to make in my life? Are there adjustments she needs to make in her life or he needs to make in his life for us to make this thing work? Do you know the difference between how a man is wired and how a woman is wired? Some of the complaints women have about men it's not because the man is bad. It's just because she doesn't know that's the way men are wired. Some of the issues in marriages in homes today, it's not because the woman is a witch. It's just the way she's wired. For example, if, you're, if you don't know that women like to talk, you'll be shocked in marriage. Hey! My Lord Jesus. I could be alone by myself for hours. But women like to talk. So when she's trying to talk, she's not bothering you. That's just the way she's wired. I didn't used to know that. And of course, with my pastoral training, you know, they train you how to listen. They train you that there's empathic listening. You know, you can't just be listening and saying yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you have to be engaged. You can't just say yes, yes, no, no, yes, yes, okay, okay, yes. <laughs> No. You have to know how men are wired too. Men think logically. There is a book, if you have the, the privilege to buy or read, I will recommend to you. The book is titled, Men Are Like Waffles, Women Are Like Spaghetti. That's a very book. I'm, I'm telling you. You've heard the title before? Yeah. Men are like waffles, women are like spaghetti. I have the book in my bookshelf. If you read that book, you understand a lot of the differences. Men are like waffles because we think in compartments. You know how waffles are like? Blocks, 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 blocks. We don't mix and match, you know? Women are in spaghetti. They like variety, you know? I can wear a black pants for days. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> but it will bother my wife. <laughs> Does it bother me? I can wear the same shoe for years as long as I have a shoe. Why well, it will bother my wife? But that's the way she's wired. She's not nagging at you. That's just the way she's wired. You must know the difference. You must know the difference. Compatibility. It's important. It's important. Understand your personalities. Are you choleric? Are you melancholic? Are you phlegmatic? And are you, what's the fourth one? Sanguine. Thank you. If this sounds like Spanish to you, then you need to go and find out what we're talking about. Because you must understand there are some periods that based on your personality, you don't want to see anybody. You just want to be alone. It doesn't mean you are possessed with the devil. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, I want to talk. Now you want to be alone. No. It's just the same person's personality. As loud as I can get, personally, I can be very loud. I mean, you see how I preach here, jumping everywhere. But do you know there are some days that even if you call me, 
I, I will even pick up my phone. I don't even want to see my phone. It's not because I'm having a mood swing. Maybe something, I'm processing something in my head and I just need to be quiet. It happens to me also like that when the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. I can be like this. You will think something is wrong with me, don't you? I can just be like this. And then I will smile. My wife knows. That's why she's laughing. <laughs> she does. She does. I will be like this. And I will smile. <laughs> it's, I'm not crazy. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> so she has learned to adjust to, you know, those moments. Um, all right. Oh, we, need, we need time for questions. All right. Um, let's move very quickly. Number three is the fear of God. There are some Christians that don't fear God. The fear of God. The fear of God. Establish that this person has the fear of God. Because the fear of God, the Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom. And you need this wisdom to build your house. The fear of God. Does this person have reverence for God? Does this person genuinely, is this person a genuine Christian? What are the fruits of the Spirit you can see in their lives? Forget the gifts. Even demons have gifts of the Spirit. Healing, raising the dead, for, put that aside. The real Christians, in fact, the name Christian means like Christ. They got that name in Berea. When the Bereans looked at them, they said, ah, these guys, they look like Jesus Christ. Let's call them Christians. That's how the name Christians came. They noticed their behavior, their, 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 their mood, and they called them Christ. Make sure this person is really a Christian. Do you know that there are some so-called born-again Christians that still listen to secular music? Yes. They have no regard for God. When you marry a person that truly fears God, you will live in security in your marriage. Even if this person travels around, you will know that the fear of God will stop this man or this woman from doing certain things. Your mind will be at rest. But when you don't trust this person because they don't have the fear of God, you will stop their travel plans, you will inspect their phone, you will, <laughs> you will check their work, you will call their boss, you will show up at their job, you will do all kinds of things because you know this person does not have the fear of God. The fear of God is what makes a man say that I will not do this evil. Not because I fear my spouse, but because I fear the Lord. Not because I, 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 I will be shouted out by my spouse, but because God will be upset at me, I won't do certain things. Several scriptures, Proverbs 9.10, Job 28.28, 28, Proverbs 24.3. The fear of the Lord is also discipline. Make sure that you are marrying a man or a woman who is disciplined. Financial discipline. Spiritual discipline. Sexual discipline. Discipline. The fear of the Lord. Proverbs 9, 10. Job 28, 28. Proverbs 24, 3. Sorry, I have to move fast. We need to take those questions. And if there are no questions, I will talk about the third leg. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Proverbs 3, 7. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is discipline to depart from evil. Proverbs 3, 7. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Proverbs 8, 13. Make sure you are not marrying a pretender. Make sure they truly love the Lord. Make sure you are, whatever you need to do, whether fast and pray. There's one prayer my wife said she prayed to God before she married me. She said she prayed to God, show me who this guy really is. There are many wolves in sheep clothing. Make sure this person truly loves the Lord. Make sure this person truly fears the Lord. Number four, before you talk about love, is the family background. 
of that person. The family background. Don't just jump into marriage. Understand the family background of this individual. Where are they coming from? What are the values that they appreciate in their family? What are the norms in their family? What are the traumas? You must understand their family background. This is very important because marriage is an extension of families. It's an extension. So the family background, make sure it's something you can handle. Make sure it's something you are comfortable with. Because if you marry somebody and you are not comfortable with his family background, they will accuse you of being a witch, of taking their child, their son, or their daughter away from them. So make sure you truly, truly understand the family background. You must know and understand the family background you are marrying from or marrying to. You must know the blessings of the family. You must know the curses. All right? You must understand trends that are happening in the family. You must understand the patterns that is happening in their home. There are some families that their ancestors have done some shady things in the past and the children are not permitted to prosper. There are families like that. There are families that, and of course I'm talking based on some things I know from where I was born. There are some families that their children are not allowed to bathe with hot water because their ancestors had done things in the past and if they dare to bathe with hot water, then curses and demons are permitted legally to afflict that family. There are some families that the children are not permitted to, to drive a car. I'm telling you these things, it might look very absurd or unimaginable, but it's real. It's real. It's very real. Understand the family background. Understand that. Find out. Ask questions. Ask the same questions in different ways. Does your, does, your, does your father hit your mother? Have they fought before? Do you know if your grandfather hits your grandmother? You are trying to find out. Do your brothers hit their wives? You are trying to find out if this guy is going to one day knock you out. Find out. So that you won't be surprised. You, said, you see, they say love is blind, but marriage is an eye opener. It will open your eyes, and by then, the deer is already in front of the car. <laughs> Family background. Asserting that. And if you happen to come from a not rosy family background, please prayerfully break some things so that they don't come with you into the marriage, so that it will make you unattractive. Pray, prayerfully break some things. I've talked a lot in this church about family and curses and stuff like that. Prayerfully break some things. Consciously break some things. Carefully stop some habits that could bring you in line with those negative patterns. Family backgrounds are important. Understand the blood group, the genotype, of that family. And it's scriptural. In Isaiah chapter 51, verse 1 and 2, Isaiah chapter 51, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye were healed, that is where you were, you were brought from, and to the hole of the pit where you were digged, Look at your origin, your background, your genealogy, your ancestry. And then he specified, he says in verse 2, look unto Abraham, your father. Look at your parents. Look at certain things they did that they did wrong. Don't repeat the same mistakes. Understand what is happening or what has happened in your potential spouse's family. 
and unto Sarah that bare thee, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Family background is important. And then finally, love is to be considered. Love is to be considered. Love is an action word. Love is an action word. You can convey feelings with words, but you cannot convey love with words. Because love is an action. And I'll show you from scriptures. <laughs> I like to defend myself with scriptures. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. When people say, I love you with words, watch their actions. Their actions will truly tell you whether they love or not. My little children. <laughs> so it is only children that love in words, <laughs> not adults. Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Love is an action. Love is in deed, in the doing. Feelings are in the words. Love is in the action. Love can only be demonstrated by action. If you truly love your spouse, you will show that you love the person. If you truly love, you won't just be calling and say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. You must demonstrate, you must show the sincerity of your love by an action. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 14, John 14, 15, John chapter 14 and verse 15. He says, if you are truly my disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You, there is something to do to show that you love. And then verse 21, he says, if you love me, verse 21, John 14, 21. He said, he that had my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. He that had my commandments and keepeth them, there is something to do to show that you love somebody. And this is where we talk about the five love languages. But before we continue... Let's take some questions. But even before we do that, let's just appreciate the Lord for this time of the word. Let's thank him. Let's bow our heads and just say thank you to Jesus. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word that you've sent to us. Lord, we receive it by faith. We receive the grace to be doers of your word. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we've prayed. Amen. You can stop the live stream now. And We thank you for listening to today's message. We know you have been blessed. So for more of these messages, please visit us on our website at www.thola.org and subscribe to our YouTube channel at THOLA TV. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at THOLA underscore church. And best of all, come hear the man of God live at the House of Light Assembly, 130 Montrose West Avenue, Akron, Ohio, 44321, or call 234-200-6172. God bless you and keep on shining. Changing